Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Unlocking the Promise of Mid-Course Conversations, a how-to for instructors and educational developers author webinar. My name is Patty Webb, and I'm the Marketing Manager for Stylus Publishing. Stylus webinars bring you direct access to our authors and their latest titles. Today, I'm happy to introduce Carol Kearney, Christine Renner, and Jordan Troisi, authors of Mid-Course Correction for the College Classroom, Putting Small Group Instructional Diagnosis to Work. This webinar will highlight the applicability of using mid-course conversations to solicit feedback from students about learning. The authors will describe ways that instructors and Centers for Teaching and Learning staff can leverage the promise of the SGID, complete with opportunities to interpret real-life student feedback and deliver it to faculty. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. We are very happy to have you all here with us today. Um, and uh, here's our contact information. I believe we will be sharing the, the slide deck with you all. So I'm Carol Herney. I'm at Colby College, I'm currently the Associate Provost of Faculty Development and Diversity and the Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. Hi, everyone. Christine Renner. I'm coming to you from Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I serve as Vice Provost for Instructional Development and Innovation. And in that role, I'm the Director of our Faculty Teaching and Learning Center. All right, and I'm Jordan Troisi, uh, also at Colby College here in Maine. I'm the Senior Associate Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning here. So we thought we'd start by answering a few questions that we started to think about as we were deciding to write this book. Um, the first one is, why is it worthwhile to have a mid-course conversation with students about how the class is going? So from my perspective, there's two really important ways to look at this question. One is the sort of conversation piece. And one, are we having meaningful conversations with our colleagues, our students, other members of our institutions about teaching? So the mid-course conversation kind of does all of that in one experience where you get to talk to students, where there's a conversation with the instructors, and then there's also a conversation across uh, the consultant who's doing the, the SGID and, and the instructor. So it's an opportunity to, to talk about things that sometimes we you know just don't have time to. We don't really sit down at um, you know meals and talk about some feedback that we've gotten from our students. So uh, that's really one of the important reasons that we think this is so impactful. I think the other thing is sort of experiences that maybe if you you know you might have had in your own teaching where you get your end of the semester feedback and you're like, oh, if I had only known that they liked a particular thing or my students were sort of frustrated by something, then I might have had a chance to at least address it or maybe make some corrections. Sure. So from those two perspectives, the sort of very pragmatic teaching perspective and the also just sort of enhancing everybody's understanding about teaching and learning, a mid-course conversation is some of the best medicine you can take. Um, so thanks. Yeah, and uh, I'll chime in on why the SGID? Um, so this was a, a passion project of mine while I was on sabbatical doing research and working with Carol and Christine. Um, and, um, you know, so my background is in psychology and I take a lot of sort of evidence-based approaches to um, how we do things in the classroom. And for me, um, you know, looking at starting to examine and think about the SGID was, um, both something that I wanted to implement and know more about and see how it would function. But then also uh, it was uh, the SGID is something that um, we had seen little clips of evidence in various places, but, but what we really wanted was a bigger picture of, of the whole process. Um, and like Carol as well, um, this sort of mid-course conversation piece is also something that I've just always found very compelling. It's uh, right at the point where you can get the actionable feedback about how things are going. Um, it's conversations with the student. It's conversations with a consultant who's done uh, an awful lot to come to understand how the course is operating. Um, it's exactly the kind of thing to sort of uh, uh, take with you and then help finish strong for the remainder of the semester. Um, with that said, I'll hand it over to Christine. Sure, and I think one of the reasons we, we titled this webinar Unlocking the Promise is that as we have been working 
working together, Jordan, Carol, and myself for the past few years, that idea of really unlocking the promise of um, an educational development practice that some may take for granted or may have just decided, well, I'm not sure we need to do this anymore. We just kept finding more and more promise and more and more impact and application and the research that we did. Um, we just really thought that there was uh, a need to sort of put it all together and really show a bigger picture of the SGID and the promise of the mid-course correction. So we're excited um, about the, this project and about this book and, and really this conversation today. All righty, folks. I'm going to take us through some of the essential elements of small group instructional diagnosis, or SGID, although certainly as we have come to find, um, it goes by very, very many very many different campuses. Uh, so uh, you might have a process very similar, um, but called something else. <laughs> um, that said, we, we view uh, six essential elements of the SGID, and I'll walk us through um, each one step by step. But here's sort of the big picture, the stuff that happens early in the semester, the pieces that happen in class to gather feedback, the processes that happen after class to consolidate, organize, and interpret that feedback. Then the piece that happens in class with the faculty member and their students. And then any sort of end of the semester debrief and organizing. So let me uh, walk us through this uh, bit by bit, especially for those that are new to this process, haven't done it before, have done it once or twice, or are looking for additional uh, clarity. We view the first step early in the semester as sort of organizing and logistics. Uh, this is true if you're at an institution that has a sort of substantial program associated with SGID, perhaps through a Center for Teaching and Learning or some other office. Uh, this would also be true if you are colleagues with someone down the hall and you want to have a, a, a little SGID uh, swap in your department. Um, so the first thing that has to happen is at some point early in the semester, establishing the logistics of what's going to happen and when, when the SGID will take place, what classroom, what space, uh, establishing a post-class meeting to go through the feedback, um, swapping of any information about the course, such as course syllabi. Um, at some institutions, uh, individuals can engage in a sort of fairly lengthy conversation early in the semester about the course to say, here's what I'm really thinking about. At other places, uh, that sort of initial swapping of information is somewhat smaller in scale, um, but sort of establishing what's going to happen when, who's involved, and how it will all take place. Um, we'd be happy to talk about if folks are curious about scaling up or how to implement this in a programmatic way. We'd be happy to talk more about the specifics that we use here at Colby and, and at Grand Valley as well. So I'm going to move us forward now check into once we've established those logistics and we're visiting the course, what happens when we go into that classroom? Uh, for us uh, here at Colby, we engage in a small, a, a short observation of teaching, usually about five minutes. Uh, and then after that, the, the instructor leaves the room, consultant engages in a short introduction, uh, introducing themselves, the process, uh, approaches associated with confidentiality and things like that. Uh, after which the faculty member uh, will form the, the students into some small groups where they'll complete some feedback sheets. We'll show you some copies of those feedback sheets later so you get a sense of what they look like. After the individuals have uh, mostly completed their feedback sheets, we start bringing folks to the board and they begin writing their responses on the board uh, in the same, uh, we use a two by three grid in the same grid uh, that they've done on their sheets. So that's the first conversation, the conversation that happens uh, in those small groups to figure out what kind of feedback um, folks are gonna provide about the course. The second of those conversations, once the student feedback is all written on the board, is a consultant guided discussion of that feedback that's written. And we will uh, give you some examples of the kinds of feedback that you see there, as well as some of the uh, processes that we often use for uh, working with that feedback. Uh, but that second feedback is, or excuse me, that second conversation is uh, going through that feedback that's on the board. 
once the class is over, uh, we have individuals take a picture of the information on the board. That way you don't forget it all. Uh, and then use that information to construct a feedback sheet that you're going to discuss with the instructor. Uh, for us, we generally take the approach uh, that we uh, copy down the information that's written on the board and then interpret the major themes that happened both from the board and the uh, conversation that ensued uh, during conversation number two. Uh, during that consultation with the faculty member, we tend to reserve about an hour for that time. Uh, it's an opportunity to check in on the themes, um, provide uh, information about the feedback, and then additionally for individuals, uh, for the consultant and the faculty member to discuss how that faculty member plans to address this feedback with students. Uh, conversation number four is what the faculty member then does with that information. Goes back to the class, ideally the next class period or, or certainly uh, soon thereafter, uh, to say, here's here's what I heard. Thank you so much for providing this feedback. Um, here are some things that are that are on my mind about it. Here are some some frames that I can provide for us to think about it. Uh, here are some things we can definitely do. Here are some things that maybe we can't do, and here are some reasons why, and so on. Uh, and then the last phase, as we get towards the end of the semester. Um, we always find it very worthwhile to do a bit of debrief and reflection on the SGID process. That could include uh, individuals who've uh, done SGIDs in one another's courses. That can include if we have programs that exist in a center for teaching and learning, an opportunity to sort of say what, what worked for us, were there problems, were there program, uh, programmatic things that were complicated, or were there things that came up we never could have expected. Um, that late in semester piece helps us catch those kinds of things so that we can uh, revise and, and see what's uh, coming up for the next semester. Uh, just to give you a, a brief uh, uh, set of uh, feedback from the kinds of things we've collected in our own SGIDs, um, we find the, the student conversation to be really robust. Uh, they'll say things like, <laughs> sometimes, uh, Sometimes they'll come with a really honest comment, like, since the homework is due the night before class, I often procrastinate, or the TAs for this class are not really well prepared to help me during office hours. But we also get some real uh, gems and favorable feedback as well. Um, all of this is very useful. Uh, for example, I always review my notes right after class so that I'll figure out what I've missed or the professor facilitates a really great discussion. And those are certainly things that we as consultants bring to that professor as well. Or uh, perhaps a student during the conversation has a real honest moment with some other students and says, um, you know what, this is college. I think it's okay that we're reading a lot and doing some hard assignments. That's kind of what we're here to do. Um, a lot of the times we get some, some big realizations out of faculty members as well when engaging in the SGID process during the consultations, they'll reflect on, uh, for example, uh, how they can help their students better understand assignments if they develop rubrics and provide some guidelines for where the assignment is going. Uh, faculty members have said things such as, maybe I should give my students examples of quality work so that they can see what I'm looking for. And when they say that, we of course say yes. Um, or for example, I had no idea they found this assignment so helpful. Or I would have never known that students were so confused about the role of reading in this course. What is it? When do I want them to do it? What are they supposed to do with the reading once they've done it? Things like that. Um, with that said, uh, let me pass it along. Thank you. So now that we have a, a little bit of a better common understanding of what we mean by the SJID and the various steps, um, uh, Jordan, if you want to go to the, the next slide, we want to talk a little bit about kind of the bigger picture and the applicability of this form of mid-course correction. And really from the research that we did, not only from looking at the literature, from uh, survey work that we did, interviews with educational developers and our own experiences, the more we dug in, we realized that there are so many different applications for the SGIDs and so many situations where the SGID was either being used or had the potential to be used. And so here are just a couple of some of the, the audiences that we had in mind when we were writing this book. 
because we realized there's so many different contexts, we really needed to make sure that we were addressing all of these audiences. So I, I think that the content is, is quite valuable for individual instructors, really, who are interested in learning more um, about the SGID and about gathering feedback in this way uh, from students. And certainly um, the SGID is for any discipline and really any course type and size. So whether that's an online course or a large class, um, we have found methodologies and we provide advice on how to go about conducting SGIDs in those situations. Well, we also wanted to make sure that we were speaking to educational developers and that there was content there for both those who were early in their careers and those who were more seasoned. And we realized that those who are consultants consider themselves educational developers, sometimes are situated outside of teaching and learning centers and some inside as well. But we've also written with uh, a couple of other audiences in mind, and that is those who are overseeing um, initiatives related to curriculum and pedagogical development. So whether that are program department chairs or program directors, um, we wanted to make sure that we were speaking to them as well. And, and certainly since we are firmly um, hold on to that promise of SGIDs, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, impacting the teaching and learning conversations writ large on a campus and climate, we also have in mind those uh, in administrative roles who are seeking to really make sure that teaching and learning um, are maximized and happening well um, on their campuses. Um, as we explored questions around SGIDs, we realized that as we were answering questions, more questions arose. And so there are certainly um, some additional questions and avenues for scholarly exploration um, that fall into the category of the scholarship of teaching and learning and the scholarship of educational development. Um, so we do um, talk a little bit about uh, how the work has been done, stepping back and thinking about how SGIDs have been researched and also what are some potential other areas of avenue for research. So I think there's one, one thing that we wanted to also address was, was getting into the nuts and bolts of making decisions about the SGID, not only who is conducting, who's involved, when is it happening and how. And so who serves, there's, these are some examples of some of the decision points that are important if one wants to do this well. And the first decision point is who serves as a consultant. Is it a faculty member who's a colleague? Is it an educational developer? Is it somebody from a teaching and learning center? Or is it a student? We've seen examples of all of these. Is the course held in person or online? Um, does the SGID, can it be adapted? And the answer is, is yes to a synchronous or asynchronous format. And I, I think we spent a fair amount of time talking and, and writing and thinking about how the conversations themselves are facilitated. And on both of our campus, we do a fair amount of, we pay attention to training of the consultants and making sure that folks are prepared um, to serve as a consultant for an SGID. Um, Jordan talked a little bit about uh, using the whiteboards and taking pictures and some folks if, if are, collect that student feedback electronically and it's entered um, or take written comments. So there are varieties um, on a theme and in, in terms of how the SGIDs are conducted. Um, but we also think that as our own programs have grown, we have learned the hard way a little bit about program administration and assessment. So we wanted to um, put some things down and, and share some advice and suggestions really about how to get folks registered and how to collect assessment data and really how to, to think about SGIDs, not just from the individual perspective, but also the programmatic level as well. So uh, on the next slide, in addition to, to the nuts and bolts, we wanted to really step back and also think about the bigger picture. And again, back to that idea of the promise. And that is that the SGID can live in a number of contexts, not only to facilitate and be part of um, teaching conversations uh, between two instructors or more, but also the opportunity to embed the SGID into initiatives, either the department level or as part of a general education uh, reform effort to really make it part that information and feedback from students part of that conversation and part of that, that initiative. 
certainly within without a, a center for teaching and, and learning that SGID is an essential element um, and service, I think, as part of a, a consultation service. But back to the promise that organizational culture around teaching and learning, the idea of a conversation, um, really having, we need more conversations and more transparency and more openness about um, what we are learning about teaching and how students are receiving and how they are learning. So the promise of really opening up on a campus level, um, I think is, is very exciting to, to all of us. So we provided um, this graphic as well to give you a little bit of a, an overview just from, from who, who is impacted or who has the potential to be impacted um, by the SGID. And if we start over in that upper right quadrant, certainly the students who have an opportunity to be part of this reflective experience, um, the students learn something from themselves and from, from their colleagues and also from the instructor. The instructor certainly is impacted by the abil this ability to gather student feedback in this way. Um, we also, all of us have served as consultants and know that we have learned an awful lot, not only from the students and from the instructors that we've had conversations with um, about teaching methods, about perspectives on learning. But also, as we mentioned, uh, the Teaching and Learning Center itself, the department and even the institution in terms of, of culture. So there are many decision points to be made, but also lots of areas of impact. All right, so as we had planned, we've got a, a fair amount of time to kind of bring you through as much as we can, a sort of a real SGID experience. Um, and uh, I see a, a, that there's a question in the Q&A that I think we can get to at the end which is how do we scale this up? And, and probably not so simple to sort of type that into the answer box. So uh, Bridget, we will get to that. Um, but we do spend a fair amount of time in the book talking about ways to scale up the SGID. Uh, so what I'm gonna show with, to you now are some results from an SGID. Um, it's been mocked up a bit and it's been de-identified. So uh, it's not revealing any uh, one particular instructor. So the first thing I want to point out to you all are the questions that uh, we use here at Colby, which is also another decision point. Um, so if um, you are looking for uh, a series of questions, we have a, a variety of options that are available in the book, but the ones that we use are, are shown here. We ask the students to, to get into small groups and answer questions about what are they doing to help their own learning? What are they doing to hinder their own learning? And what can they do to improve their own learning? Um, in the next row, we ask them what generally about the course, so the bottom row of questions are about the course or the instructor, what helps their learning in the course, what hinders their learning, and what suggestions do you have to improve their learning. We try to reserve a 30 minute block of time so that when we come in and do our little five minute just sort of, you know, getting the professor's attention, watching them finish up that five minutes observation, we have a full 30 minutes for the students to do this work and then for us to talk with them about what, what they've written down. Uh, so what you see in um, each of these boxes are actual texts that, I, that students wrote on board on the board. And oftentimes what you'll also ask them to do is check mark if their group also agrees with uh, a, a comment that they see that another group has, has indicated up there. I don't usually indicate how many groups have checkmarked a particular comment because it's not an, a uniform thing that all groups do and it would artificially inflate the importance, I think, of any one particular comment. Um, we try to forefront the process of learning in these questions because otherwise, um, I think it can often take a direction in, 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 in ways that you're not necessarily wanting. So I've certainly had students <laughs> tell me that they don't like the tie that a particular professor wears, or they don't like the time of day that classes, or the room is too hot, things like that, which are, of course, good to know, I guess. I mean, and now I know that the professor wears interesting ties, so that's a good thing, I guess. Um, but otherwise, I think we want them to really focus on the things that impact their learning. Um, my colleagues uh, that I, I worked with back at James Madison University and I, we, we studied the impact of having that top row of questions in the SGID. And we found that when we just asked the bottom row, students really felt that all the changes that had to be made were changes that the professor had to make and that they weren't really a part of the process. So we have found that seeding the conversation with these three questions at the beginning do, does a couple of things. It kind of provides some level of honesty and you, you start to realize, oh, the students are really telling us stuff uh, that are, you know, is 
you know, a real reflection of their own behavior. Um, so what I'd like you to do um, is what I would do if I was in a classroom right now and students were writing these comments up on the board. I'd like you to take a look at them so you can reveal the next box, Jordan. And um, I, I, what, so I haven't said, I haven't talked to the question, I haven't talked to the students at all. All this text starts to appear and now I'm gonna have to turn around and start talking to them. What questions would you want to ask if this was the feedback you saw? Or what results do you want students to explain to you? Jordan showed a result in one of the previous slides that says something, oh, the professor does a great discussion. And I would want to know, like, what's a great discussion? Why is the professor's discussion so great? So where are the areas you'd want to dig into? So take a peek. We're going to give you a few minutes to look at this. And then throw some questions that you'd like to ask into the chat. Um, and um, then I will show you a little bit about how I navigate this next part of the conversation. So here's what conversation number one produced, and then we'll talk in a second about the curiosities we have about this and how to move forward. Good questions, folks. So as people are putting in some of their final thoughts, um, I think it's probably worth noting that if you're a consultant for the first time, this is probably the part of the SGID that you're most concerned about. Um, and so we do spend some time when we're training consultants to prepare them for this moment, except every single one of these moments is different. Um, th there's always something new that students are writing up on the board at every SGID that you do. And please excuse me if I switch into our language, which is a, we call these MISCAs, mid-semester course analyses. Um, so uh, you really can be prepared um, in the ways that you are already demonstrating to us that you're prepared. You have some curiosities about this information and you're coming up with some really amazing questions to ask the students about. Um, and, and so from that perspective, we really feel that the SGID is something that if you come into it with really uh, curious minds and good intentions, you're going to look under rocks, you're going to find information. Is it an exhaustive evaluation of the course? It is not. And it's really not meant to be. It's really meant to get a snapshot of where the students and the, and the professor are at that particular moment and try to provide some nuances around topics that appear to be, you know, sort of really salient to the students. Um, sometimes professors ask me if I will ask a particular question during the SGID. They're like, oh, can you ask them about blah, blah, blah? And I'll be like, well, let's just see if blah, blah, blah comes up. And if it does, we'll talk about it. Um, we often don't you know, take requests to add additional questions to the SGID, although that is a variation that some centers actually do um, utilize. If it's something that they're concerned about, the students will talk about it. And I, I, I sort of like to let them and their ideas drive uh, this part of the process, as opposed to trying to um, seed any of these kinds of ideas with them. So people are asking, they're, they're wanting to know a little bit more about group work. They're gonna, they're gonna want to know a little bit more about like, why are they zoning out? I mean, you guys are seeing all kinds of things that are showing up. And I will tell you that every, every single time you walk into an SGID, if I gave you this exact same set of data every time, you'd probably go at it in very different ways. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the way that I approach this particular SGID. Um, and so Jordan, can you uh, send us into the next slide? So what I try to do is I try to look for themes or areas of interest that either I want to know more about or that appear in more than one of the boxes. I find that getting students to start talking to me in the large class format is, is you know, something to be intentional about. They're, they're not inclined to want to, even though that they've put all this idea, their ideas up on the board. So I find that it's helpful if I start talking to them about something that's very related to a, a comment that they put in there about their own behavior. Um, I, I try to not go at things that I don't really feel like need a backstory. Um, and so that if I have time to talk about everything on the board, I will but there will be SGIDs where you just have way too much information up there and you do not have time to talk about it all. I also find it really important and helpful for me to, at the end of when I start, finish my conversation with the students is to just say, okay, here's, here's what I'm hearing. Here are the main takeaways. This is what I feel I'm going to bring back to your professors. Is there anything else? Have I missed something? Oftentimes students will stop afterwards and add a few additional comments and that is often very helpful as well. 
So in this particular SJID, the themes that stuck out to me were this one, theme number one, which was about reading. I would say that in 99.9% .9 of the SGIDs, readings is something that comes up. And I like to go for this first because they really feel comfortable talking about why they're reading, why they're not reading, and why they should read either closely or two times or whatever form of harder reading they think they should be doing. Um, so I would have a conversation with them about reading and I would make sure that I can get as many voices into that conversation as possible. I tend not to pick on a particular individual student. I will ask them to raise their hands. Sometimes they all start talking at once. I had this SGID once where all the kids came up to the board and they just kind of huddled around it and wanted to talk about all the stuff. I'm like, okay, let's do that. Um, so this is a particularly good theme. It, un, um, it usually reveals some uh, behavioral issues on the part of the students some confusion that students often have about the role of reading in the course, uh, something maybe the professor might have described on the first day of class that they need to re, um, you know, examine with the students. So this is a nice low hanging fruit. It's there's no usually not really many grades associated with it, but it is often a very key element that, uh, you know, is something that's going to play itself out. And if I'm having trouble getting students to talk with me, I, um, I will, you know, sort of, you know, remember, you know, you had opportunities to talk in your small group. Does any small group want to talk about something that's, you know, related to their conversation about reading so that it doesn't become, you know, sort of singling out a person? Uh, all right, so that's theme number one. I then went to theme number two, which from, you know, when you're in the heat of the moment, this is the kinds of things you start to look for. I found the group project thing also very compelling and I wanted them to talk to me more about it. And again, it's really one of those things where uh, it, once they start talking to you, they're talking to you and it's great. It is the reason why I think I just wanna do SGIDs for the rest of my career. Um, it's just so much fun to be in there. They get really excited and interested in talking about you talking to you about what's going on. Um, and so uh, what, what I found out here really actually helped the professor make some changes to the group project. They weren't sure how they were graded. Um, they didn't understand how the work was supposed to be divided up amongst each other, um, um, among other things that I will share with you when I reveal the feedback that I provided to the professor. Um, and another theme that I saw was one about like how class time is used. So many of you point out the zoning out during class. It is very interesting how often they, they tell you that or that they're procrastinating. Um, so I, I often want to know, is like get this regular college student procrastination or is there some other something going on? Um, and if it is college student procrastination is, you know, can we get, how can we address it? So in this particular one, I, I, I noted all of these uh, items to the students and I'm like, well, so it's, it seems like we're, you know, having some issues with how classes, you know, what's going on during class. So talk to me about it. Uh, I try not to solve problems with them during this process. Uh, it's an easy thing to want to do. Um, I want to make sure that I position the instructor to be a part of that process as well. So I don't want to make suggestions about how some of these things can be addressed because I'm not the, the instructor of this class. So it's also a very hard muscle for me not to flex because I often have some suggestions that I want to impart upon them. But I think it's important for the consultant to play the consultant role, which is, you know, you're gaining this information and this backstory from the students. And now you're wanting to be able to turn around and have a conversation with the professor and then hoping that that information comes back through the professor in a way that is, you know, sort of partly how they own it and how it fits best in the course that they're teaching. Uh, so here, here's um, the third theme. The last theme, I was kind of funny to call it a theme, um, but I decided to call it a theme anyways. It, are some comments like you just want to talk about that in and of themselves, there weren't a whole lot of comments in this particular SGID on office hours, but I know that on my campus, office hours are a real thing in that students really struggle with how they're supposed to utilize them. There's a lot of anxiety about going to them. I, so I want to ask, you know, do you have, are you going to office? Do you have to go to office hours? Is everybody going? To What's it like when you go to office hours? So it could be that one particular comment like this one is large enough in the sort of context of the course or in the context of the institution that you really do need to attend to it uh, in ways that I think um, allow you to bring back some information regarding, you know, the ways that students are thinking about this. Uh, so I, 
you know, someone asked in the chat earlier, if we record these conversations, sometimes I wish I did. Um, and as I get older, I wish this even more. Uh, but as soon as I finish this conversation, I take pictures of the board and I go back and I write down, these are the four themes we talked about. Here are the things we talk about. I try to get that out of me as quickly as possible so that it doesn't uh, end up in some other database uh, inadvertently in my brain. Um, so once you're done with this conversation and before you go to the next slide, um, I just want um, to address, you know, sort of the issue that might come up, which is how do you make sure that you're hearing from all the students and that the feedback is, you know, really reflective of all the student experiences, you know, I, I think it's probably not possible for that to happen. I think that the, the, the tiered approach of this conversation process does the best you can do, which is get the students to talk to each other, get to the students to talk to you in a safe environment, you have nothing to do with their grade, and then provide that information to the professor in a way that is uh, you know, de-identified. I never mention anything about a particular student who's in the room. Even if I know those students, I tell them I'm not gonna talk about them, partly because I wouldn't be able to remember that anyways, but even if I could, you, you very much have to keep it in sort of this aggregate. This is what your students said, a student said this. I really try to avoid using even gendered references to students that might've had something particular to say that I wanna convey to the professor. And as I indicated before, oftentimes students will want to talk to me afterwards and I will let them know that they can contact me after the SGID if they need to go to another class. If there's something they want to express to me, they can do that via email or come to meet with me. So I don't know, maybe I should stop here. Is there, is there who, should, are there any questions that relate to this, Jordan? I haven't been able to. Uh, let's see, so there have been a couple of questions that have come in, uh, some of which we've responded to, Christine and I have responded to in the okay. Q&A. Um, Sandra was curious, do you have a way to get info on how students change their behavior after participating in this process? I think this is a great way to get students reflecting on their learning strategies. Um, you know, I have lots of hunches, lots of, you know, sort of inclinations. <laughs> um, Carol, if, if that's something that you'd like to respond to, uh, feel free to, to do so. Well, you know, it's a great question, Sandra. And then we and hi, by the way, nice to see you here. Um, it it uh it is a question that I wish we asked more often after the SGID here on campus, but it was exactly the question we asked in the in the research study that we did at James Madison University. So we um, split the two groups, uh, students who were in a SGID where they we asked them about to give feedback on their own learning, the top tier of questions and a, a group of students who did not get those questions. And basically we asked, how did your behavior change after the SGID? And more often than not, the students that were in this group that had this six sets of questions that, that are here on the screen indicated that they actually made changes to their behavior as opposed to the professor making changes to the professor's behavior. So I think it's a simple question of asking them. Uh, so yeah, they, they told us that they read more, they were engaging in um, group assignments more, they were uh, preparing for class more, um, things like that. I, All right. So I would add that, uh, I mean, just one more comment on that is we don't, at Grand Valley, we don't collect that information systematically from students, but we are asking um, instructors who have had the SJD in their class, their, their perspectives on student behavior and contributions to the course as a result of the SGID. So it's sort of, I guess, anecdotally, but secondhand, we are interested in that question, but haven't done a systematic job of collecting. All right, so when we're finished with this conversation, we're gonna go back and get ready for the conversation with the professor, which I think is on the next slide. In a perfect world. Right, so, um, what we do, what we do, what I do, uh, is we draft a short statement about each theme discussed, and we add it to the document that you will be able to link to below if you type that URL into your browser, which has the results that the students provided and our kind of shorthand theme-based, you know, reflection on the conversation that we have. When I go to meet with the instructor, it's like really you want to do this. You want to bring a copy of these results and you want to give it to the instructor. But you should not do that. Uh, we don't need that yet, Jordan, sorry. Jordan, 
give him enough instructions. <laughs> My bad. Um, so don't give your copy, don't give the copy of the results to the professor. I've made that uh, mistake just once. And the professor just spent the whole entire time reading the sheet and didn't really listen to anything I was saying. Um, so if you want them to listen to you, which is sort of the point <laughs> in this consultation conversation, let them know I'm going to give you these results. Um, and then start by asking uh, them to share some of their thoughts about the course and some of the issues. I often want them to describe for me some of the assessment strategies that they use, just so that we're all using the same terminology about the course. So what do they call them? Quizzes or, you know, homework assignments, projects, what have you. Um, and then I share with them the themes that I observed and the ways that the students really, and the discussion that I had with them deepen the understanding about how these themes were impacting their learning. Um, and then I, you know, I do spend, this is now the time where I can flex my, you know, educational developer muscle, my CTL director muscle, um, my, I taught large classes for a while muscle. Um, I've read a few books on teaching and learning muscle where I'm just like, or that I've done a million other SGIDs. So I know like, cause I've done an SGID in Jordan's class that Jordan tries these three, these things in these particular situations. So, you know, the wealth of experience that the consultant brings from all of their own experiences teaching is where you basically can be like, hey, I just read this book, Small Teaching, you know, maybe you should try this kind of idea, or I've tried X, Y, or Z, or your students actually suggested a solution. Um, and I thought that it's kind of got some legs. So let's talk about it. So the consultation really becomes this place where we talk about how to best address the, um, the feedback. And, and I think it's really important to say that sometimes I think the professor feels an obligation to address all of it and make something happen immediately. And while I love the, the, the title of our book, Mid-Course Correction for the College Classroom, some of the things that we find out in an SGID cannot be fixed mid-course. Um, it's, it's, it's the, the ship has sailed the, it's, it's a, a, such a structural change that the professor may not be able to make those changes mid semester. So that is the other thing that I think is important to remember when you're in doing the SGID with the students, you should not lean into promising them any changes. What really is happening here is that everybody has a broader and more enhanced uh, understanding of teaching and learning. And out of it will come often a handful, one or two really important useful mid-course corrections, right? But if you try to do them all, that would cause a whole bunch of other problems in the course that uh, may not be easy to address. So I think going into your conversation with the professor is one where you want to make sure that uh, the professor has a good plan moving forward, that you can't change that they bought the wrong textbook, that maybe you do need to get a different textbook, but going in there and taking their textbooks away and giving them a new one is not necessarily the solution here. Um, and I'm going to stop here and make sure that either Jordan or Christine might want to add some ideas here about the ways they approach this conversation with the instructor. Uh, let's see, something that came to mind for me, someone posted in the Q&A and I responded, and I think it's worth bringing up, um, how, how to approach this with someone who seems sort of uh, reticent or defensive uh, in, in their approach or, or or seems concerned about the kinds of feedback that they're going to receive. Um, first, I, I do want to point out that the, the way that we approach SGIDs is that we, we take folks on a voluntary basis. So um, <laughs> uh, hopefully everyone who's signed on has said, yes, uh, you know, I'm interested in this feedback. I think it would be very useful. However, uh, that point notwithstanding, some folks are, you know, are, are impervious to feedback. Uh, the most significant feedback would roll right off their shoulders and other folks, uh, you know, feedback can hurt or be difficult to hear or things like that. Um, so I think sort of uh, a process of kind of reading the room, what you know about the instructor can be very useful there. I think easing into the conversation uh, uh, that you have with the instructor about, you know, tell me a little bit about your design of this course or uh, the kinds of things that you uh, are keeping in mind. Uh, get get folks feet wet before we throw them right into the deep end uh, and and say, you know, you know, one, two, and three things. Um, now that said, I have generally found that on the whole, there's there there's good information in all the SGIDs. There's you know, I, I rarely get anything where where I uh, bump into the circumstances where oh, this feedback is just all all not so good. Uh, 
But that said, uh, thinking about how to navigate those discussions is something uh, to keep in mind. Um, Christina, there are other things that are occurring to you as well? Sure. I think in all of the SGIDs that I've done, nearly all the, the instructors have said, wow, I was really nervous about receiving this feedback. And I really wasn't sure what the students were going to say. And I wasn't really sure what you were going to say. And I've never been at, at, to the Teaching and Learning Center before. And I've never had a con consultation. And the pleasant, everybody leaves pleasantly surprised, not only about the deeply reflective input from, from the students, but also the entire process as well. So I think that despite misgivings, um, folks who sign up voluntarily um, do learn a lot. And the SGID, our program, really does serve as an entree into other engagements of faculty, um, of instructors in other teaching and learning center programs because the barrier has been lowered and they are now part of a conversation about teaching and learning. They've been vulnerable, they've received feedback, it wasn't horrible. And so the conversation continues. Thanks. And someone in the chat said, I'd be terrified to have one of these done. And I think I would say that I was terrified too. The first time I had one scheduled, I remember going up to my office while this was happening, thinking, what is going on down there? And how am I supposed to actually get anything done knowing that they're down there talking about me in my class? But it's always been, it's always been, you know, having had them done in my own class has always been helpful. And, you know, I'm just, you know, dittoing everything that both, both Jordan and, and uh, Christine are offering. So we'd like to give you a, a little bit of a chance to review some of the feedback that uh, we provided to this instructor. So that's the tiny URL that Jordan has uh, linked there, um, that I linked there and Jordan clicked on. So um, what we'd like you to do is just take a peek at some of the things that we uh, provided, that I provided to the professor in the themes section. And um, I think we have a couple of minutes here for people to come up with one idea that they might share with the professor something that they could do to react to some of the feedback that the students provided. So there are the discussion themes around the four topics that we um, reviewed earlier, readings, class sessions, group projects, and office hours. And if you go to that tiny URL, you can get to those things. And let's give people another minute. Like, what, what would you want to talk about? I thank you for putting the link in the chat. That's even smart. Um, We got one, one idea, suggest that students come to office hours in groups to make it less intimidating or invite them in groups. Bravo, you're hired as an SGID consultant. <laughs> it's as simple as provide rubrics, rubrics for projects, right? So you could even offer to help them create a rubric, give them some sample rubrics, um, you know, lower the barrier of entry to some of these ideas. Um, Ask students why they're not going. Um, recommend that the professor require students to come to office hours, right? Uh, so that they they see that it's not so intimidating. And you know, and you'd think that professors might have figured some of this out before, but they haven't, right? So we, we're trying to maybe demystify things that we know are really high impact and inclusive and equitable practices. But if you've just come from getting your PhD somewhere and you're landing in your first teaching job, often these things aren't th that necessarily obvious to you. So uh, they could, the constructor could provide questions along with the readings to help the students focus. Right, so readings become more intentional if the students know exactly what they're supposed to be reading and how they're, what they're supposed to be getting out of the reading. Again, can you just write all this down, Jordan? We're hiring all these people to do SGIDs at Colby, um, especially if we have to go back and do, hopefully we don't have to do them online. Um, so these, these activities and, and, and this feedback um, loop is something that you're, you're really setting the professor up you know, to close the loop when they go back in uh, to talk to the students. So why don't you just go to the next slide, Jordan? Um, so, you know, this is the part that I always wish I could be the fly in the room uh, to listen to what the instructor says to the students because um, you're not there for this one. Um, so you, I've, we've found that it's really important to set them up for um, these changes. So these suggestions that you're providing are good ones and they're often writing them down. 
Um, but at the end of the conversation that you're having with them, you might want to say, okay, so what are you going to say? How's it going to go? Give me a little like preview of what you might be doing when you walk back in with your students. And how are you going to address some of this more difficult feedback that you won't be able to, you know, make any changes about? It helps them kind of feel more relaxed about it and empowers them to actually do this. Um, and this is also, also the time where I often encourage them, if there are other things about this feedback that you don't understand or you want more backstory on, you can ask now because it's been given to you in this anonymous format. So they can look at that same grid that we looked at back at the beginning of this mid part of this webinar and be like, you know, there was something in here that I didn't talk with Carol about. Can you, can we talk about it more? And if other students are, that, you know, are willing to sort of lend some ideas to that, if their students are willing to talk more, it's, it's a great opportunity to get a little bit more out of the SGID. The one other thing that came up in the chat that I just want to mention here that um, might actually have the other conversation or the other way that SGIDs might be used um, from the instructor's point of view is in their um, annual reports or their tenure and promotion dossiers. Um, what we do at Kobe is we don't share this information to anybody except for the instructor. So the instructor has the power to put them into their dossier if they want. And again, we try to help them to understand that these are not evaluations. These are, um, you know, formative feedback experiences that they've just that they've just experienced in their course so that they can contextualize that as being part of being a reflective teacher. I did a SGID. That's not the important part. <laughs> the important part is that when you did the SGID, you then realized these things and made some mid-course corrections that semester and are planning other ones for future semesters. So um, in my role as faculty, associate provost of faculty development, I work with faculty on their dossiers and help them to integrate their SGID data. Um, but this, this last conversation is the black box and we do hope that these are productive opportunities for professors to close the loop but this is where the magic happens here. And um, we'd like to know more about it. So we're, I think Jordan's kind of cooking up some ideas on how we might be able to figure this out at some point. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're super happy that you've uh, hung in here with us and uh, we're happy to answer any more questions that you might have. And I don't know where we are with all the chat and Q and A because I'm trying not to pay attention to that. I think we've been, uh pretty good at keeping up with chat, but please do type awesome. into the chat or Q&A if you've got any questions that are lingering or if some have been unaddressed, feel free to copy and paste. <laughs> we'll well, and I'm just it. realizing I promised Bridget a conversation about scaling it up, right? Thank oh, you. Oh, yes. So, um, so the first thing you need to do when you're going to scale up your SGIDs, in my opinion, is get more people to be consultants. Um, and I think the best consultant, and we've kind of talked about this before, is someone who's had an SGID, but you know, that at some point I, I did my first SGID without having one done in my own class. So, you know, I think you don't have to have that barrier. So you want to grow your SGID team. That's the most important, you know, your consultant team. Um, the way that we manage, and we don't have like huge numbers here, but sometimes we, we, we do have pretty decent numbers, is we try to collect all the requests for SGIDs during the very early part of the semester so that we have time to plan. Um, I know that other institutions do them on a rolling request basis. And if you're trying to do a lot of them, that's crazy. It's really, I, I found it really hard to manage. So more consultants, a thoughtful kind of registration request process early in the term has allowed us here to do upwards of 40 in some semesters, which is a lot for a small college. But back at JMU, we used to do like 150. And that was the only way we would be able to get something like that to happen. So I'm opening it up to my co-authors for some of their sage wisdom here. Well, I, I will just say never sneeze at a great mail merge function. Uh, do, I do recommend uh, sending out messages that unify everything um, that, that read in from Google Sheets or some other spreadsheet. I don't know, Christine, other, other thoughts about scaling up? No, I think you've, you've hit it all on the head. And I know that we have some wrap up comments uh, from our hosts here. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. We have so many questions. I feel like this is like one of the most interactive chat bars I've ever seen. Um, so um, if you have any unanswered questions or if you want to keep talking um, with our authors, feel free to email them directly or you can email um, our general um, email, stylusinfo at stylistpub.com. 
I'm going to do a quick conclusion, but then um, if our authors are ready, they can keep going until they are ready to, to go. <laughs> Uh, thank you to all of our authors for sharing their time with us today, and thank you to everyone who tuned in live with us this afternoon on Zoom. If you are interested in ordering mid-course correction for the college classroom, use code MIDCOR, M-I-D-C-O-R, to get 20% off the book and free shipping from Stylus. I will share the link and code in the chat bar. The webinar video replay will be available by Friday and shared on all of our Stylus social media feeds. Registrants will also receive a follow-up email with all of the links uh, shared today. Uh, also visit our Stylus webinar calendar to check out our upcoming webinar events. And if you have any feedback on this webinar or any requests for future webinars, please feel free to email us directly at stylusinfo at styluspub.com. Have a great afternoon, everyone. If you want to stay in the room, you are more than welcome to. All of this information will be in the chat bar. And uh, any last minute questions, please feel free to uh, go ahead and ask. I know we did say that if there are lingering questions uh, for a minute or two, we'd be happy to address, although we do understand that many folks have to make their way to other engagements. I see Bridget just posted a question to the chat. Been training students on how to run SGIDs. Pros and cons to this? Any thoughts? Well, hold on. I, 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 did, the, I did the punctuation wrong. Pros and cons to this. Any thoughts? <laughs> I mean, I think what one of the pros is that the students will tell the other students more than they'll tell us. Um, I mean, even though I feel like they're being super honest with us, they're being honest. They're not telling us everything. Um, and that we've had that experience because we we have some learning assistants that we've been working with. And, and what those students find out from the ones that they're working with is just like eye-opening. So that's a pro for sure. I think from, from my perspective, one of the cons is, is that conversation um, uh, really number three, where the consultant is providing the feedback to the instructor, but also providing some additional resources and contexts and suggestions. We find that those of us who've kind of been training the consultants, that's a big piece. And we, we haven't figured out really how, what we would do with that for students. Like what are some of the resources that they would draw from and experiences if they haven't been um, an instructor in a classroom, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bridget. I, I think that question, that point is a good one, right? That that uh, yeah. it's not up to any one individual, including a student consultant, especially to 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 solve things, right? To feel like at the end of the day, uh, figured it out. Here's the answer. Any final thoughts? What do you think, Carol, Christine? I wish we were all in the same place. We could high five. Just me and yeah, Carol. Yeah, high five. <laughs> <laughs> and this concludes our <laughs> webinar. Our programming day. Let's do this more. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If everyone is ready to wrap up, I'm good to close the door on this webinar. Thank you so much, Patty.